Uh, so I'm just going to get started. But before I do, I should say, I really hate it when colloquium speakers are droning on like this and saying things like this. And I assure you, I will be like that at one point <laughs> or another. So stop me and ask if you have any questions. I tried to make this as uh, you know, accessible as possible to everybody. Uh, but sometimes I get carried away. Um, so I also want to say that a lot of this work has been done with graduate students here, Khadija Matiwala, who's really helped with a lot of the analysis that's, that I'm going to be talking about today. And Nick has really helped with some of the, the simulation comparisons that we've been doing as well, of course, under the supervision of Christine. We also have our, our vast collaborators. This is not an exhaustive list, um, but I just want to give them their credit where it's due. So just a quick overview. The first five, six slides are going to be a crash course on galaxy formation and dwarf galaxies. I'll then move on to talk about these peculiar low surface brightness galaxies called ultra diffuse galaxies that may have made the rounds in some popular science magazines. I'll then move forward to very briefly talk about our future paths, uh, just a few slides, as we move towards the SKA or Square Kilometer Array Observatory era. OK, first things first. Very simple picture and uh, a very poignant point. Galaxies are the building blocks of the universe. These things are what combine together to make the large scale structure that we see at large scales. Uh, and these objects in and of themselves are made up of a couple different components. The baryonic matter, the stuff that we can see, and the dark matter, the things that we can't see that some of you are trying to figure out exactly what it is through direct or indirect detection uh, experiments. Uh, but different combinations of this baryonic matter, the gas that I've shown as the blue cloud here, and the stars. There's also some dust and stuff in here. I don't want to offend anybody. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's mostly gas and, <laughs> and some stars. And different combinations of these in different halos uh, give us different galaxies. We can think of it as a, a bit of a mismatch in that respect. So I have some pretty pictures, as I can hopefully keep your attention. Um, with these. So these are some JWST uh, early access images. So you see the Whirlpool Galaxy. You see a Higgson compact group here in the bottom center. And then I think a very, uh, very common picture to see in news articles is the SMAX cluster, uh, a galaxy cluster that's uh, being shown in the foreground with a, a bunch of little, well, maybe it's harder to see here. But there are these little extended objects. And these are like gravitationally lensed objects by the, the galaxy cluster in the foreground. So talking about this large scale structure, here's a simulation perspective of it. So this is the Aquarius simulation suite, and it's dark matter only. Things that are very dark, there is no matter there. And things that are very bright, there's a lot of matter there. So it's the dark matter density that you're seeing. And there's this filamentary structure in the panel on the left. And if we zoom in on one of these over densities here, uh, that's similar to something like the Milky Way, for example we can see that there are a lot of these subhalos, or these smaller dark matter halos, that are gravitationally bound to this larger one. And this is a lot like the system that we're in, the Milky Way and the local group system. So that's made up of the Milky Way, Andromeda, and its satellite systems with some peripheral dwarf galaxies, or low mass galaxies as well. And we know from our current paradigm that these objects, these more massive ones, form hierarchically. So it's this interaction and this interplay between these smaller halos and the central one that can tell us a lot about where galaxies come from uh, as we see them today. So if we change the picture a little bit and I paint in some known objects from the local group, so we see some dwarf galaxies here. Uh, you might be familiar with the large Magellanic Cloud and maybe some of these other ones as well. But you should also be familiar with this. This is M31, or the Andromeda Galaxy, our massive neighbor. And I've chosen this to be our central object. And you can see that there's a, a diversity in the properties of these objects as well. So some of these are much more massive than the other ones. Some of them are bluer in color. Some of them are yellower in color. But it's these baryonic properties, the things that we can see, and the processes that affect them, as I've written here, that can really tell us a lot about where these objects came from and where they're going in the future, so their evolution. And for a long time, the local group, so the nearby sample that we have around the Milky Way and Andromeda, has been the sample to do these sorts of detailed studies of their baryonic properties. So I've, uh, I've split up this collage here from a, a review paper to make it a little bit more pretty for a slide. 
Uh, but from the top left to the bottom right, we're crossing six orders of magnitude. So from 10 to the nine solar masses, all the way down to 10 to the three. So from a billion to a thousand. And again, we're starting with something like the LMC and we're going down to Pictoris one. These are also at very different spatial scales. The little bar here shows 200 parsecs and it's consistent throughout uh, each of these panels. So you can see that there are very different scales. And to be able to study the diversity of the, the properties that we see here, we need to use different types of observations. But we also want to be able to push to other samples so that we're not biasing all of our theories on just one sample that just happens to be close to us. So to do this, we need a lot of different observations. And I'll try to describe some of those uh, throughout this presentation. I also wanted to give you an idea of the census of how quickly this field has really ramped up. Uh, so starting, uh, this, this figure here shows the confirmed or candidate, candidate Milky Way dwarf galaxies on the y-axis, so just a number, uh, as a function of time, so the year on the x-axis. And you can see as we moved from beyond photographic plates into the CCD or the, the digital survey era, we've seen this huge spike and we have anywhere, bless you, anywhere from 50 to 70 uh, dwarf galaxies that we've detected around the Milky Way in and of itself. So we're gaining this sensitivity as we're improving our instrumentation, but also uh, some of our analytical methods as well, or analysis methods as well. And to give you a, a different perspective of this, I wanted to give the astronomers a, a bit of a more detailed uh, respect, uh, give the astronomers a bit more of a detailed uh, picture of this if they're not familiar with it already. Um, so this is the absolute magnitude or the luminosity as a function of the size or the size luminosity uh, plot. And here we have a very narrow uh, perspective of this where we see very low luminosity objects. So things that are fainter are at the bottom of this plot, things that are brighter are at the top, smaller things in size are to the left and then bigger things are to the right, just to orient you a little bit. Um, and these colored objects, these ones are all of these new discoveries that we're seeing that overlap with the population of globular clusters. So these are dark matterless or dark matter free objects uh, that are bound solely by the, their stellar motion. So they're dispersion, dispersion dominated objects and they have no dark matter components that we know of. Um, so it's starting, we're starting to probe into this regime where there's an overlap between the things that we're detecting that we know are galaxies and the things that have been long understood and well studied uh, globular cluster stellar objects. So now I mentioned we want to push beyond the, lo uh, the local group. So these are just three examples of these intermediate or 10 to the six solar mass objects uh, around the local group that we know uh, in quite a bit of detail. So they might be a little bit hard to see and this is foreshadowing. Uh, you will not be able to see some of the images uh, of the galaxies that I'm gonna talk about later uh, because of well projectors and, and things like that. But, to start out, we want to move beyond the local group. So we want to study these things at larger distances. And to do this, we can, we can start to prepare ourselves for next generation surveys, like uh, what we'll see with the Rubin Observatory with the Large uh, Survey of Space and Time, or LSST. So this is some great simulation work done by Bertine Mutlupakdil, who's a, a professor at Dartmouth now. Um, but what you're seeing here is the exact same dwarf galaxy, so low mass galaxy, it's 10 to the six solar masses, it's fairly old and it's placed at a distance of 3.5 megaparsecs in this simulated perspective of the imaging. And the real difference that we're seeing here is that the sizes of these objects have been changed from 0.2 kiloparsecs all the way to 1.2 kiloparsecs. So the, the stellar surface density or the surface brightness, the luminosity per area um, is, is changing in this perspective. So you can see how difficult it might be to reach uh, a surface brightness of 31 magnitudes per arc second, uh, even in this very deep data that will be the forefront of the next generation of surveys. And I wanted to give you a different perspective of this. So I ran these simulations myself using Ar the ArtPop utility. It's a little Python package that lets you build up a similar uh, stellar population uh, or a mixed stellar population. But I wanted to show you a different perspective where instead of changing the sizes, we have the same size the same mass and the same surface brightness, um, but it's at different distances. So you can see how we're going from 1.5, just outside the edge of the local group, to five in the local volume, 10 in the local volume, 
and then well beyond and into the Hubble flow at 100 megaparsecs. So it's this very faint little blob, just, uh, just to orient you a little bit. It's right in the middle. But you can see that across all of these, it's the same surface brightness, uh, but they appear to be very different in these different images. OK, I'm going to just take a pause. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. This is mimicking LSST G-band observations. Yep. Yep. Anything else? OK, great. So uh, what are low surface brightness galaxies? And I put this into Google, and this is what Google told me. Uh, <laughs> so it's anything that has a central surface brightness. Or well, it's from Wikipedia, but it's that pop-up thing that, that Google tells you. Um, so anything that has a central surface brightness that's fainter than the night sky, and that's about 22 magnitudes per arc second or so, and that's way fainter than, or sorry, way brighter than uh, what I showed you in the previous panel. But I want to take a step back and provide some historical uh, explanation of where these objects really came from, and the prototypical one is Malin 1, which is what you're seeing in the left two panels here, and it's this giant low surface brightness spiral disk. Uh, that extends 100 kiloparsecs. So again, to orient you, the Milky Way is, is disk is about 30 uh, kiloparsecs or so. And this giant low surface brightness structure extends out to 100, so it's three times larger. But what I want to talk about today are these little things. These are small dwarf low surface brightness galaxies, or low surface brightness dwarfs, or LSBs as I'll refer to them. So these are much lower in mass, uh, and they're much more compact. <laughs> But they have some very unique properties that I'll, I'll try to talk to you about. And with improvements in our astronomical instrumentation, with the advent of telescopes that use a combination of, say, commercial grade uh, telephoto uh, lenses, uh, like the Dragonfly Telephoto Array, uh, in addition to these interesting uh, algorithmic approaches, so using a clever binning technique, uh, like our collaborator Paul Bennett has gone through uh, we can find a lot of these objects in existing imaging data sets. And we can also combine both of these, so using a, uh, the forefront uh, or the foremost telescope like the Subaru telescope with the Hyper Supreme cam and combine uh, that data, that very deep, very sensitive data with an algorithmic approach to search for these very faint objects. Um, we can get a sample like we've seen in the Hyper Supreme cam uh, SSP, I'm forgetting the strategic survey, strategic program. Um, but we can get this very large sample of detailed observations of low surface brightness galaxies. And that's what you're seeing in the bottom right here. And they have just as diverse of a set of properties as the galaxies that we have in the local group are. So some of these are very blue in color. So that's six on the left here. And some of these are very red. And the, the colors in these objects can tell you about the stars that are in them. So some of them have blue stars, some of them have red ones. So they have young stars or old stars. They may have gas, which is where these stars form from, or they may not, which they've exhausted their entire uh, gas reservoir. Now, one of the most intriguing subsets of this LSB population are these ultra-diffuse galaxies. And I will not say that this is a new discovery. There have been a few of these that have been uh, known in early low surface brightness studies with photographic plates. And they were at a much lower quantity in terms of how many we knew of. So the, the first large sample of these objects came up from a study with the Dragonfly Telescope, uh, or Dragonfly Telephoto Array, uh, of the coma cluster. So they, they studied these very intriguing fuzzy objects in the coma cluster, which is about 100 megaparsecs. So that scale that I showed you in the final simulation that I ran. Um, and just to, again, orient you, I told you you wouldn't be able to see it. The ultra-diffuse galaxy is at the center of this image here. And it's, it's very faint. They're very smudge-like. And they're very difficult to pick out in, in just any old optical imaging. Um, again, you can see some comparison here with M31 uh, or Andromeda, the Sombrero galaxy, M104, uh, Andromeda's nearby neighbor, M33, along with a couple of its dwarf galaxies. The Fornax dwarf galaxy is also here, and then M82 as well. And you can see that the sheer size of this object in its distribution is quite a bit larger than a typical dwarf galaxy. And I have an asterisk here, and I'll talk about that in the, in the next slide. 
Um, but these objects typically have an effective radius, or a, the radius in which half of its light or stellar mass is, is contained uh, is greater than 1.5 kiloparsecs or so. And many folks have, have deemed these to be as big or as bigger than the Milky Way's disk itself. Um, but that's, a, again, a controversial topic, I'd say. They have very faint central surface brightnesses, so 24 magnitudes per arc second or fainter. And we also know that they're found in all types of environments. So this is a paper that we put out uh, last year that shows the number of UDGs on the y-axis as a function of their host environment or their, their host halo mass. So things that are like the Milky Way or Milky Way analogs are closer to the left here, and then things that are like galaxy clusters are on the right. And by and large, what we see is that there are about an equal number density of these objects, uh, regardless of the environment that we find them in. But because there are so many of them just in sheer numbers in these more dense environments, constraining where they could have come from is a, is a lot more of a readily uh, accessible thing to do. So we know some of the formation mechanisms for where these cluster UDGs could have come from. But it's a bit harder to do that once we push into these uh, lower density environments, or even when they're in isolation, especially when they're in isolation, because how can something that's so diffuse form without any sort of external perturber? Well, I also wanted to just quickly address this, uh, because for those that might care, uh, this is a, a very controversial thing. I think maybe mostly this is for Nick. Uh, <laughs> uh, but. Some folks do not like the use of an effective radius because it biases the way that you are parameterizing a given object. So for, for some comparison, this is an elliptical galaxy, a spiral galaxy. We have an ultra diffuse galaxy and a dwarf galaxy. And their stellar mass or stellar surface density distributions, so as a function of radius, are shown in the right panel here. And you can see that the elliptical galaxy and the spiral galaxy very clearly are separated. but the dwarf galaxy and the ultra-diffuse galaxy appear to have very similar properties when you look at them from this perspective. And again, if you look at their effective radii, they're drastically different. Three for the ultra-diffuse galaxy and 1.2 for the dwarf galaxy. But if you used uh, a, a fixed stellar surface density where these authors have chosen one solar mass per parsec squared, you see that they're much closer, 4.1 and 3.8, so within their uncertainties. So understanding you know, how these objects came to be might also just be uh, a lost cause if you are using a different metric for how you define them. But I'd also like to propose a counterpoint that they're actually a bit of a peculiar bunch in and of themselves. These are just a selection of the papers um, that show that some of these objects are very extreme in their properties. Some are mostly made of dark matter. This is a bit of an older paper, but I think DF44 still stands true as it's a, a unique object. But then other ones that don't have any dark matter at all, and other ones that challenge the Lambda CDM paradigm and invoke things like axions instead. I also wanted to give you an idea as to what these objects look like in different environments from a, a visual perspective. And I, this is how I like to, to make things make sense for me as well. So hopefully that also works for you. Um, we have two UDGs that are in clusters, so you should be able to see them a little bit better here with the stretch in these images, and then one that's in isolation. You can see that these two are much smoother in their profile, so they have very calm um, morphologies, and they're a bit redder and diffuse as well. And then this one on the right is all by itself. We know it's gas-rich. It was detected in a, an all sky or a wide field um, sky survey in neutral hydrogen gas, or H1 gas. Um, and it also has these pockets of star formation as well. So it's these different properties of UDGs across environments that are also clues towards where these objects could have come from. I also think that having some context as to the different formation, formation mechanisms that, are, that can be possible for these objects is useful. Um, and I'm also going to talk about the only two that we can use uh, to help constrain where these could have come from from an observational perspective. So the first one is this high spin halo. So this is simply the angular momentum is dictating the sizes of these objects. Um, and that's a, a, from a semi-analytical model um, early on in the discovery of these objects in large quantities. Another one has been uh, observationally, I think, 
confirmed, I would say, I go out on a limb saying, um, by some of our collaborators, um, where it, these interactions from a tidal perspective are causing the large sizes in these objects. So looking for a, a stellar stream that's associated with the density in optical imaging of these ultra diffuse galaxies near a, a more massive neighbor. Uh, the bursty star formation scenario is one that is uh, near and dear to our hearts um, from an H1 perspective because it's one of the only ones that gives you a, a, a mechanism that you can constrain through H1 observations. So this is early episodic uh, bursts of star formation that then expel matter out to larger distances and then in turn affect the underlying dark matter distributions in these objects. And the last one, it's a bit of an interesting one, uh, but is also uh, very uh, unusual, I'd say, is that these major mergers between some dwarf galaxies at low masses early on in their evolution can dictate the large sizes in these objects. So it's, a, it's almost like it's a combination of uh, this one here and this one uh, to create the large sizes in these objects. Okay, to be able to do all of this across different environments is a very difficult thing to do because you want to be able to constrain things that are in clusters in isolation, and you want it to be as uniform of an analysis as possible. And so I'm, and we are members of the Systematically Measuring Ultra Diffuse Galaxies Survey, uh, where we set out to try and understand where these objects could have come from in a, a systematic way. And again, I know there are some folks here that are on big proposals and big projects that have very fun acronyms, but I think ours is the best. <laughs> uh, our things look like smudges, and they are smudges. So from that perspective, uh, I think that's a win for us. So we really want to treat this imaging and the selection of these objects very carefully in uh, the optical imaging surveys that we go through. So we use all of the optical imaging from the dark energy spectroscopic instrument pre-imaging surveys, or more commonly referred to as the legacy surveys. Um, so these are a combination of about 20,000 square degrees of imaging that we've combed through, um, through with a, a very sophisticated pipeline where we make sure that we remove any sort of artifacts like PSF tails and any cosmic rays that may uh, influence our, our imaging. We then go through and ensure that all this masking can uh, all this masking doesn't remove our faint sources in any sort of uh, systematic way. And then we use wavelet transforms to pick out the different scales that these objects uh, might have their uh, emissions spread out at. And then after all this is done, we run uh, a machine learning classifier that can then uh, pick out things that we've pre-trained on uh, so that we don't have any sort of high, surf high redshift objects that uh, may fall into our sample uh, as well. So I mentioned that we scoured through 20,000 square degrees of sky. So here's a, a sky plot of this with the different surveys that are part of the, the legacy surveys uh, imaging footprints. And then on the right here, you can see a log of the density of these objects. So it's not a full uh, scale of where they all are, um, but just to point out, here are some nearby large scale structures. So we have the Virgo cluster that's uh, very close by, the Coma cluster, which is where all of this uh, analysis really started. And then we have things in the south like Fornax and 7144. So with this, yeah, with this, we really need distances because we want to convert the angular properties that we see on the sky, so things that we just characterize from the imaging in and of itself, to a physical property. And we need distances to go from something like an arc second to a kiloparsec. And this is just four examples of objects that we've detected in some of the work that I'll describe in a couple of slides. Uh, and I, I want you to just take a second to take a look at them, and I'll tell you which one is a real UDG. And then you can feel proud if you, <laughs> if you selected the one as a real UDG. So just a few seconds, and I'm gonna take a sip of water. All right, well, if you guess one, I'm sorry, you're wrong. Two, you're wrong. Three, you're wrong. Four is the only UDG in this sample. And it's, if you were able to pick that out just off the bat, that's great. Uh, but I can show you about 100 more of these objects, and then we'll see <laughs> if, you can, if you can keep that up. If you could, that, you could uh, be very useful for a machine learning task. <laughs> so 
obtaining distances for these objects, oh, I have another picture. Obtaining distances for these objects are usually done through either ground-based or space-based imaging by resolving the stars in these objects. So you can do this from the ground out to about five megaparsecs or so. And then for these very faint luminosities, you could use something like the Hubble Space Telescope out to about 17, maybe 25 megaparsecs if you're lucky. But you could also use something like JWST, but uh, that's another discussion that if you have questions about, I can talk to you about. Um, but this is a very consuming and difficult thing to do, especially for objects that are in isolated environments. And so we've set out to exploit the neutral hydrogen or H1 gas in these objects. So again, for those that may be familiar, uh, here's a nice image of what this is. is. Um, the, the mission stems from a spin flip transition of the hydrogen atom, and you get, <laughs> an, and you get a, an emission, a photon that's emitted at 21 centimeters. Uh, so this is very commonly referred to as a 21 centimeter line. And we're very thankful that we can observe all of this from the ground, and we can build very large telescopes uh, to help us with this. So if you want a very sensitive and not so detailed perspective of what the gas looks like in, or what the H1 looks like, in a, a galaxy, you can just use a, a large single dish telescope like the Robert C. Bird Green Bank Telescope or the GBT that's shown in the top center here. And that gives you a one dimensional spectrum. So you have intensity on the y axis, and then here we have the velocity on the x axis. So you can take the integral of this line and you can get an idea of the H1 mass. You can take the centroid of this line and then you get a distance, which is very useful in converting from an angular property to a physical one. And then you can get a rough idea about the dynamics of this object by looking at the broadening of this line. If you want to instead shift towards having a more detailed perspective or, or a resolved perspective, you can use an interferometer like the Very Large Array in New Mexico, uh, which combines several individual smaller single dish telescopes to provide higher resolution. So, NGC 2403 in the bottom right panel here, you can see its H1 emission is shown excuse me, in cyan, and its stars are shown in pink. And you can see that the, the H1 extends further out into the dark matter halo than the stars do, uh, and that could tell us a lot about the dark matter properties of these objects as well. So we've put together the smudges in H1 survey, so we've used the Green Bank Telescope to observe many of these uh, ultra-diffuse galaxies. Uh, from our search through the legacy survey imaging. Uh, so we've, we've gotten a bunch of these spectra. There it is, okay. So this is, this is a, a footprint of our entire survey. So we have five individual campaigns that are all completed uh, with some uh, changes to our selection function in the final two campaigns to improve our detection rates. So we have over 500 hours of observations that we've put into this uh, for 387 UDG candidates and Khadija has been very great in helping going through some of this data reduction and analysis uh, for these last two campaigns especially. Um, so we have over 103 detections, so about a quarter of them have been detected uh, in H1, which is great, and we've able to, been able to determine that 37 of these are UDGs <laughs> and 66 are dwarfs. So this is a uniformly selected sample of UDGs and dwarf galaxies that we can start to compare to one another. And this is something that uh, no one has, has put together before, which is, again, very useful from that perspective as well. So in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to show you some of the main results from this paper uh, where we compare the, the different properties. So on the y-axis here, we have the central surface brightness of these objects. In the panel on the left, we have the G minus R color. And just, again, to orient you, things that are bluer are towards the left here. Things that are redder are towards the right. So think of things on this side as star forming, things of things on this side as not star forming or quiescent. Uh, and then on the right panel, we have the effective radius in terms of arc seconds, so it's angular size. And then smaller things are towards the left, uh, bigger things are towards the right. And then we also have the marginalized distributions shown on, on the top and right axes. And the main takeaway from this, I should probably have a big point here, is that it's really hard to distinguish as just looking at these objects. So if, if we could just look at these objects, as some of you were able to do in that sample of four, 
uh, then we wouldn't necessarily need to go through this whole rigmarole, rigmarole of getting distances to these objects if we could just <laughs> use their, their angular properties. Um, again, because I'm going to be showing this in a, in a couple of slides, the objects that are in blue squares are, are H1 dwarfs. So the dwarf galaxies in our sample, things that are in orange or orange stars are the UDGs. Red circles are our non-detections or our objects that we were either not sensitive enough to or simply have no gas in them. And then the full smudges sample is shown in gray. We can look at their H1 properties, especially the ones that can tell us a little bit about their, their uh, dark matter properties in terms of their velocity widths in comparison to other H1 samples like the alfalfa survey. So this is this uh, wide field uh, sky survey or untargeted H1 survey uh, that looked for gas-rich objects. So these are primarily going to find more gas-rich objects because that's what, uh, that's what they're expected to do. Um, and they have a subset of these objects that are just like uh, our sample, and that's shown in green and purple. So these are H1-bearing ultra-diffuse sources, or HUDs. And we can see that they very much overlap in this parameter space. And if we shift towards looking at their H1 properties uh, as a function of their stellar mass properties, again with the same symbols as the previous panel, we see that they generally follow the same trend, but they are on average less gas rich, especially at these intermediate and low stellar masses. So we're probing an entirely different population of objects than these untargeted H1 surveys are. Now some cool preliminary work from Khadija and Nick <laughs> and our group. Uh, so we have the H1 mass as a function of stellar mass once again, but this is comparing for the first time in large quantities two simulations. This has not been done before, and it's very interesting, very preliminary work, um, but we're really excited to get this out. So we have two different simulation suites here, a high-resolution uh, zoom-in simulation called Nihao, and then another one that's a bit of a larger volume, um, but gives us a larger quantity of objects uh, called Romulus. And the UDGs and dwarfs in both of these samples are shown in uh, orange and green, respectively, and then the dwarfs are shown in yellow and a lighter green. Uh, but we, what I want you to take away from this is that they seem to follow the same trend as our observations. So the simulation folks are, are doing an okay job from, from our perspective. <coughs> Sorry? <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> but we also want to be able to make more concrete statements with this sample. So uh, what I want to show you is a, a predicted trend from the bursty star formation scenario, again from the Niehaus simulation suite, uh, where they find that gas richness should scale with the sizes of these objects. So the ratio between their H1 mass and their stellar mass should scale with the, si the sizes of the stellar distributions in these galaxies. And we started to do some of this work uh, early on uh, with just five objects. And I think I've made this point now, but I think other people, so Christine and I put this paper together six years ago now, other people would have fit a line to this, I'm, I'm fairly certain. Um, <laughs> And we could have had some relation, the Speck and Karuna Karens relation. Um, but we didn't, because we're, I think, a bit more rational than that. <laughs> uh, but we did start to build up a sample. So this was from the pilot survey, uh, again, a few years ago now. But we started to see that there was a clear distinction between dwarf galaxies, which are shown on the left here, and ultra-diffuse galaxies that are shown on the right. So the different color mass spins, or the different colors show different stellar mass spins. Uh, and you can see that there's generally some sort of a trend going on here. And this could be the log coming into play, or this could be a sample selection. Um, but it is an interesting effect. And this is what the full, the full sample looks like. So it's the same panel, but I've split these objects up into UDGs and dwarfs separately. Um, and then I've also subdivided them by their stellar mass spins. So you're seeing UDGs on the left, dwarfs on the right, and then the different stellar mass spins that I've just put labels on instead of putting a bunch of numbers to, uh, to make things a little bit more difficult to read. But the overall trends are shown as these dashed lines. And you can see, maybe you can convince yourself that there's a trend here, but statistically speaking, there isn't. Um, but also statistically speaking, there is no difference between these two. The uncertainties on these fits are actually overlapping and from my perspective, I don't know if they're significant enough 
to say that these are two distinct objects that formed through this mechanism specifically. It's entirely possible that dwarfs and UDGs formed in the same way and that something just happened to allow us to, to have UDGs uh, at the end of the day. But we do need more detailed observations for this, and this is where higher resolution imaging can come into play. So I showed you these two images before, and then we can get a rotation curve out of this. So we look at the velocity of, of the H1 emission as you go out in radius from these galaxies. And you could do some kinematic modeling to get an idea of the dark matter properties of these objects, which are really essential in making detailed comparisons to these observations instead of comparing the global properties in and of themselves. We can also start to combine the H1 distribution with the star formation tracer to look at their star formation efficiencies on a resolved scale. And then we can also look at the morphologies of these objects to see if there's any sort of evolutionary history that we can uh, we can get from these, uh, from these observations. But it's hard. There are just seven of these objects that have detailed high resolution H1 imaging. And only five of these have relatively well behaved, uh, modelable uh, H1 emissions or H1 maps. And just two of them <laughs> are sufficiently resolved enough that we can use some of the tried and tested uh, mechanisms or, or modeling techniques that we've used for years. Um, so I know that uh, Nathan and the Wallaby folks here have been pushing the limits of how we can start to model these objects with very low resolution, uh, but it's still a difficult thing to do when you don't have that much emission to work with in the first place. I just want to quickly focus on this one object here. This is AGC 114905. And it's had almost 100 hours of total observations dedicated towards it to come to this conclusion in the figure on the right here. So this is the rotation curve or the circular velocity as a function of radius for this object. And you can see that it starts to, to fall off and taper off and flatten out as we refer to it as. And the authors of this paper suggested that there is no need for dark matter for this object because its rotation could just be um, explained by its baryons, so its gas and its stars alone. Uh, but some <laughs> Very detailed and very uh, well-worded, uh, <laughs> uh, well-worded explanations were put together by Selwood and Sanders in this paper, um, and very quickly as well. Um, they were on this on the archive rather quickly, um, and they they clearly stated that in these numerical simulations that they ran for an object with the configuration of AGC one one four nine zero five, the H1 disk would dissipate very quickly. It would not be stable, and it would need some sort of a, a dark matter component to keep it uh, living or lasting as long as it is today. So we need more observations of these objects at higher resolutions to determine if, if these things are the norm. Are we going to start to be bamboozled by um, these analyses that suggest that there are lots of dark matter free objects when in reality we should be uh, a bit more rational in, in our approach to understanding these objects. We can also use these higher resolution observations to constrain tidal formation of these objects. So like I mentioned, our, our collaborator Paul Bennett found a few of these objects that were at the ends of these stellar streams around more massive galaxies. So this is the ultra diffuse galaxy here. And then you can see in this uh, histogram of this figure on the left, that there are these streams that connect to it. So there's some sort of a, a tidal connection of these objects. And they're not necessarily uh, tidal diffuse galaxies as well. It's a, a bit of a different topic. But we have some very interesting um, high resolution <laughs> imaging of a few of these samples now. And this was put together by uh, Catherine Fielder, who's a postdoc at Stewart Observatory. And this is a, a gas rich interaction between uh, a more massive galaxy and this ultra diffuse galaxy here. So we're wondering, is it possible that the extended emission that we're seeing here uh, is coincident um, with its formation? Is this size that we're seeing for this object uh, part of where, um, part of the interaction history of this system? You can also get a little bit crazier, and you can look at the NGC 1052 system. And this is what really sparked the dark matter free uh, galaxy, I think, hubbub. Uh, you, saw, you may have seen a lot of this in popular science magazines, but NGC 1052 and DF4 have, I think, combined over 
100 or maybe 200 orbits of HST imaging that have been allocated to study whether these objects are at the distance that they are uh, to confirm whether they are dark matter free or not. So it's these two faint objects. And so some folks have really drilled uh, their proposal writing down and they're able to get as much time as possible. Uh, but this system is really unique, I would say, because of its orientation. There are a lot of these faint objects that are along this seemingly similar axis. And in this, in this paper, they suggested that what we're seeing is the remnant of an interaction between two original progenitors around the, the central galaxy NGC 1052. Um, and it spewed out these dark matter free objects as part of it. Now, what we can do with H1 is look to see if there's any residual H1 in this interaction. Um, so the folks uh, based out of Yale, um, Michael Keane, who's a, a PhD student there, uh, has some meerkat observations to do exactly this. So it's really exciting to see what uh, a next generation telescope uh, is gonna be able to, to tell us about this system. And I also wanna say that we have a lot of these ultra-diffuse galaxies that we're gonna have observations of as well. And this isn't even the full sample. There are, I think, six more objects that I have not updated this slide on. Um, as I was scrambling before <laughs> coming down here, I realized that I didn't put those on there. But we're gonna build up this sample at this resolved end. And we think we'll be able to, to hopefully put some sort of a nail on some sort of a coffin on whether these objects are real or not. And as we push forward and we look towards next generation surveys, so something like the Wallaby survey that folks here may be familiar with, uh, with the Australian SKA Pathfinder, or even pushing forward looking at more unresolved observations with the Canadian Hydrogen Observatory and Radio Transient Detector, uh, which would look at the entire northern sky. So again, sorry. Uh, so this is the proposed footprint for all of CORD. I assume that hasn't changed. Roughly, okay, sure. <laughs> and then Wallaby is gonna look in a lot of the southern sky. And in some of the analysis that I've done, and this is still in, in preparation, it's slow to come together, but uh, I've predicted that we should see somewhere between 4,000 and 6,000 low surface brightness galaxies detected in the Wallaby survey. And about 10 to 20% of these should be ultra diffuse galaxies. So we should have some somewhat detailed observations of these objects as well. And all of this, is uh, leading towards, I think, the inevitable, which is the machine learning future. Uh, and I think I've had some interesting conversations about whether that should be the way that we go about this or not. But I think that having something like this, uh, this neural network that has been set up by John Wu at Space Telescope Science Institute, um, which can classify whether an object is, uh, is gas rich or not, and then use gradient weighted class activation maps or grad cams to pick out which component of an image, solely the image, could be gas rich or not. So if we look at this spiral example here in the bottom left six panels, uh, we see that we have some sort of a spiral galaxy and its central bulge is gas poor at relatively high confidence, but then its, uh, its spiral structure is gas rich at, a, again, uh, intermediate comp uh, confidence as well. So it's applying these sort of techniques at lower masses that I think building up our sample is important for so that we're not biasing <laughs> future analyses uh, for the SKA era. And that's the, the last thing that I wanted to quickly mention is that we're really gonna heavily rely on some of the results that will come in the next five to 15 years from the SKA mid. Um, and it really will expand a lot of the work that we'll do with something like Meerkat, which is the current uh, most advanced telescope uh, or most advanced uh, interferometer from an H1 perspective. So we'll have a, a, a fourfold increase in the number of dishes, a very large increase in the collecting area, so greater sensitivity. And then the baselines will also allow us to have, the longer baselines will allow us to have these very high resolutions in our images as well. So I just wanna leave you with my summary, which is, I think this is what, all summaries should say is that there's much more work to do because there always is. Um, but we have this very interesting um, approach to looking at these objects with H1. And we have this very interesting sample that we've put together uh, to study ultra diffuse galaxies and dwarf galaxies as a whole. Um, and what we see is that they don't appear to be different uh, in, again, just our sample, uh, but we have these detailed observations that are coming up 
And hopefully this can inform us and set us up for success as we move on to ongoing and next generation surveys as well. So I'll stop there and take any questions that you have.